Do y'all remember when I covered these books? DC's take on the real world that's affected by their characters? Well, yeah. This kind of gentleman left this comment on one of those videos that states that Marvel has a similar book, so today we're going to be checking them out. Written by Matt Chernis and Peter Johnson with art by Alex Maleev, this is Marvel's Powerless. In this world, we follow the character of William Watts, who has visions of our 616 Marvel Universe, but he actually lives in the real world. Like, the Marvel real world, so it's not real real, but its elements are more realistic to a degree, and pardon me for talking too much, so anyways, let's get into it. The story opens up with a narration talking about what you see when you die, and how the narrator feels like just an observer in a world. This narration is against the backing of the Avengers fighting Galactus in a city, then BOOM! Smash cut to a bald guy waking up from a coma. His name is William Watts, and in this video, I'll be referring to him as William mostly. His blonde doctor says he's been in a coma for three days after being found unconscious on a sidewalk. The doctor's husband walks in and calls her by her name to go to lunch, and her name is Dr. Richards, so it's Sue and Reed. Next, we see that William's a therapist, and he's talking to his patient, Emma, who is complaining about how this guy, Scott, is with a girl named Jean instead of her. Then, Emma walks out, and William sees his next patient, who is Peter Parker, which sets off visions from that other world he saw in his coma, but he thinks it's nothing. Peter talks more, and then he shows shows off his arm. He was bit by a spider and it left his left arm completely useless and disgusting looking and he says, it may look nasty but the chicks love it. Yeah but sure they do. He then mentions how his uncle was killed a few months ago and William knows the story already. Cause just like us, he's seen all the Spider-Man movies and he has visions from the 616 universe. Peter gets anxious and leaves early and then we see William contemplate whether he wants Peter to return so he can help him or if he wants to venture further into the those visions of that other world. All the names in this book ignite feelings in him that he can't explain. We see some familiar names in his appointment book like Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, Charles Xavier, Matt Murdock, Bruce Banner, and Brian Braddock. We then cut to see Peter getting bullied by Flash and then being saved by Gwen. Harry's here too and he says that they're invited to dinner with his dad because his dad wants to hear about Peter's internship at Stark Industries but Peter brushes off the offer and Harry leaves. Gwen says that Peter should have off his friends, but Peter insists that he gets a very bad feeling when he's talking to Harry's dad, Norman. He says it's almost like a sixth sense, like almost like a, like a, like a spider sense. Gwen calls him crazy and leaves. We then get a shot of the Galactus fight in the city that pans down into the real world as we get William's narration that he has seven appointments today, and he's heading to his first one right now. On the way there, he sees a street magician, Doctor Strange, who spouts that he can read fortunes, and he learnt it in Tibet. Anyways, William heads into the courthouse to his appointment, it's with a lawyer, Matt Murdock, who is representing Frank Castle. He presents his case stating that Frank is actually the victim, and then he talks more and we see the Punisher's origin where his family is shot down by criminals, in this case Leland Owsley. Frank survives, but this time he goes to find Owsley, but by the time he finds him, he's already been beaten to death by some thugs. Frank has his hands on the body as soon as the cops arrive. Matt continues stating that the real killer is still out there as we see Wilson Fisk sitting at his desk in his office. William and Matt then walk out of the courtroom after everything's finished and Matt trips cause he's blind but he's not like superhuman blind and at the door he bumps into something again that something is Kingpin. He's just standing there to watch. So Matt and William keep walking out and then on the street Matt says that he needs William's help to overturn the case because Frank admitted to the crime after 36 hours of interrogation. So Matt Matt wants William to help prove he wasn't in his right mind when admitting to the crime, but William says that he's got shit going on at the moment and leaves. Cut to Aunt May's kitchen where Peter is eating. He asks if she's ever wished to be in another world, to which she says that problems have a way of following people. Then there's a knock at the door, so Peter goes to answer it, and it's Norman Osborne. Cut back to William in bed. He's awoken by his phone. It's Matt Murdock saying he's figured it out, that his case leads to Kingpin, but nobody else will touch it, so he pleads with William to help, but William denies, and then he walks into his kitchen and he's lunged at by Wolverine, and Wolverine's got these claw glove thingies. Wolverine asks if he knows Charles Xavier, and William says yes, because he's a patient of his. Logan then explains that he killed Charles, but he doesn't remember anything, and that the claw things are like a second nature to him, even though he has no memory of them. But we cut back to Aunt Mays. They're all sitting around the table, and 
and Peter is very defensive. Norman tries to take a look at some of Peter's notes, but Peter grabs him away quickly. So they step outside and Norman cuts the facade. He's basically like, listen here boy, I can make your life easy or hell, so tell me what's up with Tony Stark because I'm his main business rival. And then he gets in his car and leaves. The next thing we see is Karen Page in an alley getting shanked, and then we see Matt standing with a rose beside her hospital bed. Cut to Rikers Island. We see Matt talking to Frank more about the whole kingpin situation, and then we cut to Foggy and Matt having a discussion as they box, and Matt is kicking the shit out of Foggy. We see that Matt is determined to take down kingpin. Then we see William in the Manhattan Hospital psychiatric ward, where he is meeting Bruce Banner, a man who has an alter ego of being a violent, angry, rage monster. Wink wink. William sits down and barely says anything, and then boom! Banner explodes, and it's just a middle-aged white guy yelling at another middle-aged bald white guy. Cut to Stark Enterprises, where we see Peter working with Dr. Connors. Peter gets a call from Gwen, who's working out, but Tony Stark comes in, so he cuts the call short. Tony decides to show him the secret project that he's been working on, and can you guess what it is? Yeah, big surprise. It's an Iron Man suit. Wow, amazing. Tony needs Peter's work on his silk fiber or whatever as the last piece of the puzzle to his Iron Man suit, and Peter is shocked and stunned and has a look on his face that says he doesn't know whether to side with Tony or Norman. Cut back to Williams walking into his living room and he tells Logan some info that he learned from his cop friend. So the reports of Charles Killer fit Logan, but the fingerprints at the scene don't match anybody else in the entire world, and it's as if the person who killed him doesn't exist at all. Logan then decides to leave and he leaves the claws on the table. We then cut to a courtroom and Matt calls Kingpin to the stand to question him, but he isn't able to prove anything, and as Kingpin leaves, he says to Matt that he hopes that he had fun with his line of questioning. Then we see Logan at a bar with a hot lady offering to buy him a drink. The lady's name is Mystique, and she asks Logan to light her cigarette. He obliges, and then he recognizes the symbol on his lighter. OMG Nightwing. I, I mean, it's the Phoenix. It's the Phoenix logo. But then he remembers who he is. He's Weapon X. Mystique then reactivates Logan into Weapon X and gives him his new target. Our boy, William Watts. So next we see Logan walking back into Williams. He sits down and puts on the claws and then he lunges at William. But William recognizes the look of someone under hypnosis and starts to talk his way out of the situation. He suggests that Logan should go back to the same bar tomorrow and get answers because he knows for certain Logan has been brainwashed. For some reason, Logan doesn't kill him immediately and then he agrees and then we cut back to Matt. He walks into his apartment and it's been turned inside out and Matt panics and calls for Hockey. So instead of following that for a little bit longer, we cut right back to William during a therapy session with Peter. Peter is hesitant to talk about anything because he has a spider sense and thinks that Norman is always listening. He looks outside and sees a van, so he's most definitely right. So Peter does the with great power comes great responsibility speech, and he slams the door and leaves to do the right thing. And then William thinks to himself about when or how he became such a coward as to not get involved involved and just sit back and watch. Peter walks up to the van and tells the guys surveilling him to suck a dick and if Norman wants the details of what Tony's up to then he should hit Tony's line. Then he slams the van door and leaves. This Peter's got it, you know, like, you know what I mean? He's just got it. Cut back to Matt in the boxing ring. He thanks Foggy for letting him blow off steam and box with him, but we see Foggy is tied up or dead in a locker and the guy in the ring with Matt is the same guy who stabbed Karen. He gives the beats to Matt and and then he says Karen's gonna get killed, and then he leaves. Matt then rushes to the hospital, but we see a needle being injected into Karen's IV bag, and by the time Matt gets there, she's dead already. Oh, and there's a bald guy who tells Matt to come with him, as he has something to show him. They get into a limo and talk. The guy says that he's lucky that Matt's blind, so he doesn't have to try hard. Like, he doesn't need to look tough, wear a disguise, or throw Matt in the trunk, because he's blind. The bald guy then takes Matt's glasses, and we see that he's left Matt in a field in the middle of nowhere, and says, the jigsaw line. Game over. Truthfully, this part of the story makes me really sad. Like, I'm not very invested in the story, but this just feels so mean-spirited. Like, damn dude, if you're a bad guy, then kill him. We then see Norman in his penthouse talking to himself about his schizophrenia and his medication. Then he gets notified that Hank Pym needs to see him immediately. Apparently, someone hacked into their servers and deleted all the information related to Project Juggernaut, Norman's project that would rival Tony Stark's Iron Man project. And who Whoever hacked in left a message for Norman. It's a Spider-Man themed message saying, Norman, the 
spider bites back. Have a nice day. So yeah, Peter's not subtle at all, and yeah, he's definitely gonna get it. Cut to the courtroom. The judge is all like, where the hell's Matt? Foggy is there, so uh, he's not dead, but how'd he get out of that locker? He was like tied up. We see that Matt is actually alive and he's making his way back to the city. Then we cut back to the bar. Logan reports back to Mystique and says, mission accomplished. And she says thank you on behalf of the 12. He then asks about the 12. Then she asks for a light and he says nah. So she heads outside and makes a call, stating that Weapon X has been compromised. She's on the phone with an Eric about the Phoenix Project and says that she's gonna kill Logan, but then Logan stabs her in the back. Bang. Then we're back with William. He's walking to his second appointment with Bruce, but on the way he manages to find Matt in an alley. Wow, it's amazing. He just managed to stumble into him, and Matt called out for help just as he walked by. Incredible. He then takes him back to his safe place, and now William is talking to Foggy, and he tells William the Daredevil origin that we know. Then we cut to the White House. A dark figure Eric. asks Victor to take out Logan and William to save Project Phoenix. So so he takes the assignment and he leaves with Mortimer, a character that we never actually see. Then we see Logan and William looking through Mystique's purse and talking. Then we see Peter walking through the streets wondering if he did the right thing by hacking into Norman's servers. And he's super paranoid, worried that everyone around him is watching him. We then see a newspaper stating that Tony Stark won the government contract over Norman and Oscorp, which is supposed to be a good thing, but also Iron Man isn't a good person, and especially in this world, he's just another capitalist piece of shit. So boo to him and boo hoo to Norman cause we then see him pissed off in his office and he starts to hallucinate an alter ego of himself in his reflection. It starts talking to him and telling him to give Peter one more chance and to be more persuasive. Back to Peter, he walks into Stark Industries and Tony gives the underage lad alcohol. Great guy. He then toasts to Norman Osborn and says his company should fall into hell. Wow, great guy. And Peter leaves. Cut to Rikers Island and William's sees a bunch of Spider-Man villains, but they're just normal inmates, actually. William's there to talk to Frank. They talk, and then William gets it, and then Frank leaves. We then see Frank staring at the moon, out the window of his cell, and we can see the Punisher skull on the moon. Cut to Peter in a park meeting Gwen. He tells her about the Norman situation, and she replies in a way that I had to read through a few times to make sure that it wasn't a joke. She's like, there's no way that you can convince me that Norman Osborn, one of the most powerful rich men in the city is surveilling you. You, who works for a direct competitor to him, who he absolutely hates. And then she calls Peter crazy and then leaves. Like, what the hell was that? That was honestly so hard to believe. So as she leaves, she's kidnapped by Norman Osborn. Oh, woohoo. I guess we're gonna watch Gwen bite the bullet again. Great. Excited for that. So Peter goes home and he gets a call from Gwen, but it's actually Norman. He's sitting beside Gwen in his car and he tells Peter that he has two days to get the info on Project Iron Man or something bad's gonna happen. Despite being a smart guy, Peter is really stupid. He really left a message saying it was him, and now that's coming back to bite him in the ass. Great job, Spider-Man. Cut to Logan and William in an apartment. William tells Logan to come look as the street lights are out. Then Logan grabs William and covers his mouth and quickly pulls him on the ledge outside of the window of the apartment as men with guns come into the room looking for them. After searching the place and not finding them, the men leave. Logan follows them and then jumps on the back of their car, and then he smashes through the windshield, causing the car to crash. Victor steps out as Logan stands there, ready to get his answers. But as I thought, Logan brought claws to a gunfight, right? So, uh, ah, nope, because Victor doesn't have a gun anymore, and Logan takes off his claws to beat up Victor with his fist to send a message to Eric. He then tells Victor to piss off, and then he leaves. Then we see Peter in Aunt May's kitchen with Captain Stacy, who is asking Peter if he knows anything about Gwen's disappearance, stating that he knows that the last place she went to was to meet Peter in the park and that he knows that a phone call was made from her phone to Peter. Peter lies and says he doesn't know anything and thinks to himself that it would be his fault if she dies. Oh boy, I wonder what's gonna happen, huh? Peter then rushes to his room, grabs the Stark documents and leaves, but not before slamming another door. This Peter Parker is a monster who has claimed his first victim, smashing an innocent picture frame, holding a picture of him, Aunt May, and Gwen. Trash. 
Badger. Cut back to William walking in off the street. He's going to see Matt because he's decided to help and decided now is the time to make a stand. He tells that to Matt and then holds out a new pair of signature Murdoch red shades, which Matt can't see. So like William should let Matt touch them because if he just holds them there, how is this normal blind man Matt Murdoch gonna know that they're there in front of him because he is blind. Anyways, cut to Matt making his return to the courtroom like Michael Jordan coming out of retirement and then we cut to three hours later where he holds up a picture of the man who interrogated Frank Castle, Matthew Senrick, who from a quick Google search isn't a Marvel character and is a writer from Robot Chicken, either a coincidence or strange inclusion. Anyways, this Matthew character who interrogated Frank is a thug who works for Kingpin. Then we cut back to William. He's at home and gets jump scared by Logan. Logan says he didn't kill Xavier and then they have a conversation and Logan basically said he has a lead. The name is Eric and he's going to follow it. But William is upset that Logan is leaving and they have this nice exchange where Logan states the growth William has gone through from being a coward begging for his life when they first met to now standing and angry yelling at Logan that he can't help or be involved with Logan's journey anymore. They end it by shaking hands as Logan leaves. Next we see Peter and Stark Industries stealing more files. He then calls Norman and they get ready to meet, but that's too much information. So back to William. He's in a therapy session, but Peter comes in. So William kicks out his client and then he has a quick chat with Peter before he goes to hand off the files. Peter spills the beans on the Norman and Gwen situation. Not them fucking that one time situation, but the one that we're dealing with right now. Peter is here because he wants William to be the one to give the heroic speech to Peter that you see in movies before the climax. But Williams is like, nah, sorry Pete, I ain't that guy. But you make your own future, so you go out there and kill it, champ. But also, real actions have real consequences. Brackets. Don't get your girlfriend killed. Because I have visions of an alternate world where I see Norman Osborn and he always kills your girlfriend. Thanks, Doc. That's just what I needed to hear. Slam! Again! Ah. Beautiful. I hear that every time this Peter slams a door, an angel gains its wings. Next, we see Kingpin in his office, angry and smashing a vase because of Matt pursuing him. He's on the phone with his thug and he tells him to fully take care of Matt this time instead of just ditching him in a field, alive. The next thing we see is a bunch of killers and masks standing on the ledge outside of the window ready to turn this whole ride upside down. But cut to William seeing Bruce again, who says William seems scared and he decides to stop being a bystander and rings the police to report Gwen's kidnapping. Cut back to Matt's, he calls the police to report a murder at his place and then the killers bust through the window. Kingpin comes in and guilts Matt, stating that he knows that years ago Matt was the reason that Karen got hooked on drugs and that he's the reason that she was killed now. He then proceeds to kill Matt, but the police arrive as he is still killing him. Mid -kill. Kingpin is done for. Cut to Peter. He walks into Oscorp and he goes to Norman's office, which has a balcony. He tells Norman that he's not stupid and that he knows that once he hands over the documents that Norman won't let them live still. Then they hear cop sirens approaching. Peter realizes and he knows who called and knows that this is his chance. So he holds the documents in his cripple arm over the edge of the balcony and the papers start to fall. For some reason, Norman runs straight for him and dives off the edge with Gwen to grab him. Peter manages to use his cripple arm to grab her and surprise surprise, Gwen is not dead. But Norman falls to his death and lands on a cop car, dead. but clutching one of the papers in his hand. If I was a poet, I would say that this is poetic or ironic or whatever ick it is. So now we get a narration from William stating that Peter stopped coming to therapy because he shook, but I and Logan is off doing his own thing. We see him going through a metal detector in Washington, D.C. Get it? Because this guy doesn't have a metal skeleton. Haha, <laughs> awesome, funny stuff. We then see him walk through a door with a plaque on it displaying Senator Eric Magnus, New Hampshire. So Magneto is the senator of New Hampshire. We get more narration from William as he's in his apartment looking through his telescope. He sees a newspaper on the ground with the headline, Hell's Kitchen Hero Matt Murdock Found Murdered. William then takes a moment and breaks down in tears. Cut to a press conference where Kingpin is thanking everyone for getting his charges dropped. But we see someone putting on gloves and it's free man Frank Castle. He then loads some bullets into a rifle and he shoots Kingpin in the head as he says, Consider yourself punished, motherfucker. He doesn't say that last word, but yeah, pretty much what he says. Then we cut back to William. He's still narrating about his journey as a person from just a watcher to now a fully fledged character who gets involved. He then goes to shave. He's now clean shaven and he's just a bald guy. But in the mirror we see his reflection. He is the watcher. Big surprise. The last thing we see is him 
holding a straight razor in his hand as he narrates about being powerless. There's a T.S. Eliot quote that closes off the story as well. But other than that, the end. We need to talk. DC did it better, no question. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's get into this more. But no, for real, I thought the story had its moments, but overall, I don't think it fully committed to its premise of being in the real world. With William having visions of the 616 Marvel world throughout, it doesn't completely dedicate to being in the real world, and it also isn't dedicated to being in a world with clear supernatural elements. Peter has a spider sense, but not really, and William has visions of superheroes from other worlds who are the same people as those in real life, but also, those superheroes don't exist in the real world here. Perhaps my opinion here is wrong, but I think without fully diving in, the story can't make full use of the real world premise that it's striving to use. Other than that, the art is nice, it has this noir aesthetic to it that I think is hard to describe, with the usage of blacks and how each scene or location has its own generalized color, I think that's a great distinctive look that I appreciate. And I do like some of the character moments, but truthfully, I don't think it's that good, and I can't seem to focus on anything else. And I just remembered how mean they word to Matt by leaving him to die. I don't like how he made it back and managed his way to William. That feels like a little bit of a stretch, which is a nitpick, but also this is supposed to be a realistic world. And in this world, we still have an Iron Man suit, so what? That's ridiculous, but I don't mind the Punisher being real because he's just a mean guy with a gun like, no issue. As far as trying to understand this story, I haven't looked into it. I think that perhaps William is the watcher of this universe, so he gets the visions from other dimensions or universe that come through, which haunt him. And in the end, I think to stop it, since he has the ability to see those other universes, but doesn't understand them, he takes his own life. But also, it's left up in the air, so whatever. And that was Powerless. I hope that you guys enjoyed. Uh, this week, I'm trying a new voice setting, so let me know in the comments if you like it, or if you prefer the old voice settings. I'm working on making my new setup right now, so I hope that my voice is sounding better. But anyways, thanks for watching.